Merry Christmas, Walden Church. So glad to have you joining with us during this Advent season. And uh, a few months back, you might remember, uh, I led us through a time of learning about joy. And I said I was tired of the complainy, lazy, entitled, offended world that's out there. And I said, you know, when you come here, when you come to church, you should be coming to a place that fills you with joy. And you know, you, you already feel like the world beats you up, the world makes you tired, the world's negative, sends negative messages in, and I, I, just, I just feel like God's house, Sunday, this time right now, this should be a time of joy. So we've been looking at Isaac Watts' song, Joy to the World. He tries to capture some of that Christmas story. He says, joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king, let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. So that's what we are doing right now. In these Advent weeks before Christmas, we are preparing him room. Preparing him room, joy to the world, the Lord has come. He is coming. He is coming. And that's what, that's what Advent means. Advent means arrival. We are waiting for the arrival of the Messiah. And if you knew it was happening, right, this Christmas, right, this Christmas the Messiah is coming, would you celebrate Christmas the exact same way that you did it last year and the year before that and the year before that? Or would you find a way to prepare him room? Isaac Watts, who composed many of the hymns that we sing today, he wrote Joy to the World. Watts was a preacher's kid, and he thought, probably, like many kids do, that church music was boring. So he uh, complained to his dad, and his dad said, well, if you think it's boring, then write new songs. So what happened was Isaac grew up, and he became a very popular minister. And just like you'd expect, as a popular speaker, uh, he also had a lot of negative criticism, right? He had a people that didn't like him because he was innovative. He was creative. He did different things. He tried to find a way to make the Bible relevant to his listeners. Well, some of his hymns and songs and sermons that were published, and eventually they caught the eye of a young woman named Elizabeth Singer, and she was so captured by what she read that she became his biggest fan, and she began a correspondence with him. And then one day, in a letter, she wrote, Would you marry me? And he said yes. Now, remember, they had never met. <laughs> they had never met. She fell in love with his words. So when she saw him face to face for the very first time, she wrote to a friend. He was only five feet tall with a shallow face and a hooked nose a prominent cheekbone, small eyes, and a death-like color. Wow. Love at first sight. No. Sadly, she retracted her proposal, and she left him heartbroken. So Isaac Watts poured himself back into his work, and he be began composing songs that became timeless classics for you and me, like We Are Marching to Zion, and When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, and some of the most important contributions, you know, when we think about art history or music history or science history, we see a lot of those come from people who are brokenhearted, people who are down in their luck, people who are sad, but also people who didn't give up. They just found new and creative ways to express themselves. Well, even though he was a minister, Isaac Watts is still most remembered for his music because he didn't just take the scriptures and then just drop them on top of sea chanties or drop them on top of old bar tunes like other composers. Isaac Watts tried to make joyful music that related to the common person, that had shared experiences. But it, it didn't go over uh, all that well. Some of his critics uh, accused him of being a pagan, being a heretic, being in league with the devil. Joy to the World, when he wrote it, it wasn't even supposed to be a Christmas carol. In fact, when you think about it, there's nothing Christmassy in the song 
at all. I, it, there's no Mary, there's no Joseph, there's no baby Jesus, right? There's no, there's no night star. Watts was simply trying to write Psalm 98 in a more contemporary language because it's the psalm that talks about uh, looking at all of God's creation and then bursting into song and then all the victories of God. In fact, if you look at the very last verse of Psalm 98, verse 9, it says, Before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. That sounds a lot like Isaac Watts' last line, he rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove. The psalm looks forward to the day when heaven and nature would sing about God and all the promises of salvation would be fulfilled. Well, of course, Isaac Watts is studying this passage and as he's writing the song, he thinks to himself, well, this already took place. This messiahship took place in Jesus. So he adds the line, joy to the world, the Lord is come. But actually, maybe what we don't all know or don't even realize is when we sing that song with the original lyrics, we sing joy to the world, the Lord is come, is come. It's true. I know it. When you think about it, it sounds grammatically incorrect and we change it sometimes. When, when new singers sing it, or you see it sung on TV, sometimes they change it to the Lord has come. But Isaac Watts wrote it in present tense, not past tense. That's because Isaac Watts knew that Christ coming to the world was not a one-time event. And it wasn't something that just only happened 2,000 years ago. It was something that happens every day. That Christ comes into the world. Christ comes into your heart when you prepare it, right? In every moment. In fact, right now, Christ is as close to you as your breath. Here's something else that's surprising. Joy to the world didn't catch on. <laughs> it didn't catch on until decades later after Isaac Watts had died. Because originally, you used to sing joy to the world to the tune, come thou fount of every blessing. Try it. <laughs> Try to sing joy to the world lyrics with come thou fount as the song. The tune that we sing today was actually written by Lowell Mason and it was written decades after Isaac Watts died. And Mason had a very similar story. He also experienced rejection in his life. He was worried that he couldn't make it uh, as a musician in the world, so he became a banker in Savannah, Georgia. Mason wrote a bunch of music, and he always sent it to publishers, and they would always reject it. Uh, he even got a rejection letter once that said, the American people want new folk music, not classical standards. Mason was crushed, and like Isaac Watts, he just poured himself into his craft. and. He also uh, played the organ for his church. He taught Sunday school for his church. And then somehow, 15 years after his last rejection, a music society that was kind of like a fan club of Handel, they found his compositions and they ordered 50,000 copies from him. So he started writing again he wrote more than 600 hymns, including My Faith Looks Up to Thee and Near My God to Thee. Three years later, he put his tune that he wrote with Watts's forgotten song of Psalm 98, Joy to the World. And then we've got the song that we all know. Then in 1911, that's more than 100 years later, after Joy to the World was written, it was put on a record. And the jubilant spirit of the choir that sang it made it feel like a Christmas song. And today, it's hard to imagine a Christmas carol without Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. 
Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. It's a, it's a song for people who have a little bit of a rebellious streak in them. It's a song for broken-hearted people who don't give up. It's a song for people who don't get the recognition that they deserve. It's a song for people who use their gifts, and even though they never realize that they are planting seeds that will eventually bear fruit that they might not ever even see. It's a song for people who see God's past promises and they are coming true in their very lives, in this very moment, in every rock and hill and plain. And maybe it's a song for a rebel like you. It's funny when we make those Christmas banners, right? We make the Christmas banners, or you get a Christmas card, there's just one word on the cover, you go through the store, and they've got those signs placed throughout, and there's just one, one word that they think captures Christmas, right? Sometimes it's joy, or uh, wonder, or Noel, right? Or jolly, wish is a popular one, or cheer, or peace, but uh, never rebel, <laughs> right? You never see rebel. Christmas is about a baby, it's about a night sky, it's about a big star, it's about loving parents, it's about wise men bringing gifts. But let's not forget that that baby also grew up and that baby had a ministry. He had a, a message that he gave to his followers and those followers took that message into the world. One of his followers wrote, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Don't love the world. I don't think Tiny Tim would approve. But that's okay. Because Christmas is something new. Christmas is something new. You know, at Christmas time, Jesus steps into human history and he turns everything around. Because God loves us. And he wants to repair all the damage. He wants to fix all the pain. And that's exactly what the world was waiting for. Christmas is a time to be on tiptoes. It's a time to be way too excited to fall asleep. It's getting those butterflies in your stomach because you're looking around every corner and you're shaking every package. But it's not because Santa Claus is coming. It's because the Lord is come. So let every heart prepare him room. Listen to this passage from Matthew chapter 2. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And, being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night, and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. And this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt... I called my son. We like the wise men, 
right? We like that story. We, we want that story. It's a huge part of the Christmas story. In fact, if you have a nativity or a creche at home, you probably have the wise men as part of it. We, we love the wise men. So I'm going to suggest that we add the word rebel to our list of Christmas words. Because I know we often think of rebellion as a negative thing. But for the believer, it is a holy calling. You know, a few weeks ago, we talked about saying no to some things. Well, this Christmas, a lot is going to be asked of you. Meals to make, snacks to send to school. Both kids are going to need a white elephant gift. Everyone wants you to attend their Christmas party or their Christmas Eve service. And there's so many gifts and so many people to buy for. So let's just be honest, right? Let's just be honest. If you really want peace on earth and goodwill towards men, if that's the Christmas you want, if you want a holy day and not a holiday, if you want Christmas that has meaning and substance with less emphasis on presence and more emphasis on his presence, then you are going to need to rebel. There is going to be a holy rebellion. You're going to have to rebel against all those forces that want to influence Christmas. And I think I can make a case for that. I can. Because in the very beginning, the story of the Christmas uh, story was, was rebellious, right? But it wasn't a typical rebellion. It's not... It's, rebellion is usually turning away from a thing, okay? But Christmas is turning towards a person. In Luke 2, you see that Caesar, Augustus, he's tightening the grip of his empire from India all the way to England. And he requires a census of everyone in every place. And from that point on, Rome is the backdrop of the entire New Testament, which means in all of the New Testament, in all of that story, there is rebellion against empire. You would agree, right? I mean, when Jesus is born, Rome worships 12, worships 12 gods. They worship 12 gods. Jupiter, he's the king of the gods, the god of thunder and lightning. Juno, wife of Jupiter, goddess of women and fertility. Mars, son of Jupiter and Juno, god of war. Mercury, god of travelers and tradesmen. Neptune, brother of Jupiter, god of the sea. Venus, goddess of love and beauty. Apollo, god of music, archery, healing, poetry, and truth. Diana, goddess of hunting, archery, and animals. Minerva, goddess of wisdom, learning, arts, and industry. Circes, goddess of agriculture, harvest, and the seasons. Vulcan, the god of blacksmiths and volcanoes. And Vesta, the sister of Jupiter and goddess of hearth and home. And there is one more. That's right, there's one more. There's one more. There's 13 gods that you are supposed to worship. And the 13th god is Caesar. Caesar was divine. Caesar claimed to be God. In fact, archaeologists have uncovered coins, Roman coins, that have these inscriptions. Salvation is found in no one other than Caesar Augustus. There is no other name given to men whereby they can be saved other than Caesar. And Caesar is Lord. Do any of those inscriptions sound familiar? Octavian Augustus called himself the son of God. And the poet of that day, Virgil, who died years before Jesus was ever born, he says in the writings that Augustus would mediate between heaven and earth, and he would bring peace and goodwill to men. Which means early Christians were rebels. They took imperial propaganda and they spray painted Jesus' name right on top of it. In fact, Peter's first sermon in Acts 4 was a direct affront to the supremacy and the divinity of Rome. 
In fact, his first sermon would have been high treason. That in, in one sentence of his sermon, he takes two claims that Caesar made about himself and he transfers them over to Jesus. Peter says in Acts 4, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which he must be saved. And how did Peter die? Caesar killed him. How did Paul die? Caesar killed him. So when we read the Christmas story, and we see at the very beginning of that, that the angels sing, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. That is the announcement of a rebellion. After Mary gets the news from the angel that she's gonna carry the Christ child, Luke writes that she sings the Magnificat. And what does she sing? He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. She is singing about the transfer of power, right? From those who have power to those who will have the power. She's singing about rebellion. Francis Schaeffer became a Christian when he was 17 after reading the Bible for the very first time. He was a very bright teenager. He had questions about life and about philosophy, and he noticed that the books of his day did not help. And so he was convicted that the Bible would have the basic answers to life. And he wrote in his book, the reason Christians were killed is because they were rebels who worshiped a personal God, an infinite personal God only. And to Caesar, this was treason. But it's hard. It is hard to rebel, isn't it? It's even harder to rebel at Christmas. I mean, I like Santa Claus. I like Christmas trees. I like stockings. I like ugly sweaters and I like chocolate. But the Christmas sermon that the pastor preaches on Sunday strongly rebels against the shopping and the TV specials and Rudolph and Frosty. I know. Even I don't have it figured out. The best I can understand is that tension we feel, that struggle we feel, it's just idolatry. People talk about the spirit of Christmas. You'll see it in movies. Or they'll talk about, it, it was all fixed with Christmas magic or, or the joy of Christmas that lives in your heart. But Christmas is a thing, right? It's just a thing. It's not a spirit. And it's not magic. And Christmas cannot satisfy the longing of the soul. It cannot bring peace on earth. And it cannot bring goodwill towards men. Only Jesus can. The early Christians, they pushed back against empire and culture. And they rebelled. And they said, Caesar is only a man. They said, only Jesus can satisfy. Only Jesus is truth. Only Jesus is the way. Only Jesus is life. So what's, the, what's that one thing that you feel is competing with Christmas? If you're going to make room for Christ in your heart this Christmas, as the song says, what has to get out of the way? What is saying to you that it satisfies when you know the answer is Jesus? What it, because whatever it is, it's an idol. In the first century, it was the kingdom of Rome. But today, it certainly feels like the kingdom of more. So this Christmas, I say rebel, rebel. Rebel against Christmas becoming an empire of more. Economists tell us that 50%, that's half, right? Half of Americans that are spending money on Christmas this year are charging it and they're still paying for the Christmas of last year on their credit cards. So they, they maxed out their credit cards last year and half of them are still paying for it this year. There's got to be a better way to worship the birth of our Savior. Isn't Christmas a remembrance of the one who came as 
a poor person? Someone who said that even the Son of Man has no place to lay his head? Last week we said Mary and Joseph, they brought the poor offering to the temple, right? They didn't put, they didn't, they didn't charge, they didn't say, well, I want the best offering, so you just put it on our, put it on our credit card, right? They got the offering they could afford. Be like Mary and Joseph. I mean, in his own ministry, Jesus was a champion for the poor. So maybe it's time to rebel. So before, after service, we all run off to the mall or run home to Amazon. And before we add seven more people to the gift list, let's kind of just pull the reindeer reins in. Okay, let's, let's slow the sleigh and just ask ourselves, what is driving this? Why? Why the more and more? Why the busyness? Is it because you just want other people to like you? I mean, so much so that you're willing to go into debt? All for what? Just a thank you? Is it because you want more? You want more stuff? I mean, do, we even, do you even use the Christmas gifts you got last year? I mean, chances are, neither do they. Is it pride? Do you just like being the person who gives the best gifts? Isaiah 55 says, Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? You know, I mentioned a few weeks back, we said that in order to say yes to Jesus, you're going to have to say no to some other stuff. So, sorry little Bobby, I didn't buy you a lot of gifts this year because Pastor David said it was time for me to rebel against consumerism. <laughs> I know that's, that's how this sounds, right? I'm not asking you to have a heart that's two sizes too small. In fact, what I'm suggesting is that you allow God to expand your heart this season. Because it's all wrapped up in that word, obligation. We just feel like we're obligated to so many things at Christmas. We feel pressured to buy a gift for everyone. But the Bible says the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Romans says, owe no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Psalm 37 says the wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. Believe God's word, right? Don't believe me rebel and believe God's word. Giving gifts is fine. Of course it is. Of course it is. It's a way for us to remember the wise men and their gifts and Mary, but like the wise men, just be wise with your spending. Be wise before you go into debt. I'm not suggesting we don't buy gifts. All I'm suggesting is give differently. You push back against consumerism. You don't settle, right? Don't settle for plastic. Don't settle for superficial. And when you celebrate Christmas, celebrate his lordship. Like the song says, like Isaac Watts wrote, prepare him room. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. Because every year, when you decorate, the stockings go in the exact same place. The tree goes in the exact same place. Everyone sits around the table. Everyone's going to have a place. But in the song, Joy to the World, it reminds us that Jesus also must have a place in Christmas. He can't get pushed to the edges by consumerism. He has to be in our hearts. And so I'm going to suggest that you rebel against a consumer Christmas. That maybe in all the traditions you have currently, you just find ways to adopt new traditions that allow your hearts to prepare him room and keep Christ in your Christmas. I'll give you a couple examples, a couple things that could help. Uh, I read about a family that celebrates Christmas uh, that on Christmas Eve, the night before Christmas, their family tradition is to have a birthday party for Jesus. 
and they have cake and ice cream. <laughs> and I thought, I like that tradition. <laughs> cake and ice cream on Christmas Eve? Then we get to have a birthday party and sing happy birthday to Jesus? Our family, we read the Christmas story from the, from the Gospels on Christmas Eve. Um, you know, and I think another one, I know, I know every kid now, you know, they, it used to be they all wanted some hot toy, and now it seems like every kid wants something electronic, right? It's either a video game or a, or a device, right? That's, that's what every kid wants. They want a video game or, or a device. But maybe I would say, because those gifts are so expensive, helping our children prepare room for Christ as well, we can model right behavior. And maybe before they get their expensive gift, you take them with you when you go shopping for your Operation Christmas Child box, right? Or there's a needy family in your community, or you find out about an angel tree, or uh, buying gifts for uh, the children of soldiers that are currently uh, deployed. Don't go to the store by yourself to buy those things. Take your children and grandchildren with you. Invite them along. Make a day of it and show them that, hey, before you get this like crazy expensive thing that you are so blessed to get, realize that there are kids in the world who have less and take them along with you and then show them this process. Help allow them to pick items out. I think that would go a long way to preparing our child's heart for Christ. Besides, what happens when they get the video game anyway on Christmas Day? On Christmas Day, they get the video game, or they get the cell phone, or they get the iPad, and what happens to them? Boom, they're gone, right? They're gone. They disappear. They vanish. And for as much as, I mean, even, even in my house, we love video games, we love cell phones, we do. For, but for as much as we love them, they are not tools that allow us to celebrate family, or, or unity, or communication. So maybe Christmas Day, just rebel a little bit, and don't allow the kids to isolate. Don't allow them to run off. Encourage activities on Christmas Day while the family is there for doing things together. You know, we said earlier that there's a place for the Christmas tree, there's a place for stockings, right, in the Christmas home. Have a place for the nativity. Have a nativity. You know, I, I have several. <laughs> we, Joanna and I collect them every year uh, just because we love having them around the house. It's, it's the visual. For as much as my children are going to see a tree or see stockings or see garland or see lights, I want them to see the story. Make sure the nativity has a prominent place in your house. We do Advent candles at church. There's no reason why you can't do Advent candles at home. Uh, a lot of us have an Advent calendar at home, right? That's either a Christmas tree or chocolates, or now they have Lego, right? But you could have an Advent candle set at home as well, and you could walk your family through the weeks and pray and make it a part of your Christmas tradition. Make sure that the focus, that, see, this is all I'm saying, is at Christmas you can find ways to make the focus more outward, not just inward, that you're going to do something that is similar to Christ, similar to his teachings. Jesus talked about the poor. He talked about doing things for other people. It only makes sense that at Christmas time you would do that. Maybe it's even just knowing that there is someone on your in your neighborhood or on your street that is alone. And just maybe on your walk, next time you see them, just ask, hey, what are your Christmas plans? Hey, if you're not doing anything, my wife and I, or you know, my husband and I would love to have you over for dinner. Have someone share in your Christmas meal. Movies are a big thing too. Uh, at my house, we love to watch all the Christmas movies. We've already started. And there is one called The Nativity Story. Okay, make sure that one falls into the rotation. It's a, it might feel a little old, 
But that's okay. A lot of the Christmas movies we watch are old, right? And I think the visuals in it and the story in it, the way that story is told is wonderful. It really captures the Christmas story. And if your kids are like, oh, we don't want to watch this movie, just say, hey, you know what? Joseph is in Star Wars. <laughs> and last, I know it's busy. I know it's crowded. I know there's strangers everywhere at Christmas Eve, but please don't skip attending church on Christmas Eve. I know it's a, you know crowded and it's hard to find a place to sit and you feel like, well, you know, where were these people all year long? But attending church on Christmas Eve is important because of those new faces. Because those new faces are here, we need you. We need you to spread that cheer and that joy and to shake those hands and to be that smiling person and to welcome those people in, to make sure that this feels like a home. Not so that they'll return next Christmas Eve, but so that they'll return next Sunday. I got one more. I know I said that was the last one, but I got one more. And this, this one, this suggestion, I think is is really rebellious. But maybe it's also a little bit of real Christmas magic. This Christmas, forgive someone. The baby in the manger came to forgive our sins. And in the same way, we are also asked to forgive. So maybe instead of a new tie or a cookbook, what your brother or your sister-in-law or your uncle or your son needs is forgiveness. Talk about a gift. That would be a gift. Mercy and grace, that is the best gift ever. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. Let's pray. Lord, we are now two weeks in to Christmas and already feeling the pressure and the tension of the hustle and the bustle of getting everything done on the list, of buying every gift, straightening the house, having Christmas parties, travel. Lord, in all of it, help us to remember to prepare room for you, that there would be room in our hearts for you. This Christmas is about you. It is about your son. And it is about this wonderful gift. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. And we thank you for early Christians who stood up against empire, who stood up against the popular prose of the day, and they rebelled. They stood against tyranny. They stood against falsehood. And they spoke for truth. And they lived for truth. And they died for truth. May we be people who always passionately pursue truth above empire, that we push back against culture because we are children of God. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for this season. May every church burst at the seams this Christmas Eve. May there be a flood of people that seek to, to know the Christ child and to know the story and may heaven and nature sing. Amen. Well, we're so glad that you stopped by and that you spent this week with us. Of course, we want to let you know that we have a Christmas concert coming up on December 10th and 11th. Uh, it's going to be the same concert both nights, and so just pick the night that works the best for you. It's completely free. Invite your neighbors. We'd love for you to attend. Uh, we'll have Christmas Advent services every single week through the holidays. We're going to have two Christmas Eve services on December 24th, one at five o'clock, 
and one at seven o'clock. And the very next day, I know it's Christmas, and yes, Christmas falls on a Sunday this year, but we will not be offering any services this, that Christmas day. We want you to stay home. We want you to spend time with your family. We love you guys. We'll see you next week. Bye.